So we measured several different uh, effects of uh, behavior economics and several different examples of how they can be applied on real business. If you think about it, they were quite simple, right? It's really easy to test this kind of things and they can generate some really nice benefits to your company for sure. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for an eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the irrational relationship between them. Our goal is to help you win more business at higher prices. I'm Mark Stiving, and today our guest is Pedro Picoli Suarez. Here are the three things you want to know about Pedro before we start. He is currently Senior Executive Manager of AI Pricing at Sixth. He mentors startups. He has an engineering degree, like me, but he works in pricing. And he's a purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm glad I haven't upset him yet. Welcome, Pedro. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks for, for the nice introduction. <laughs> hey, no worries. It's going to be fun. Um, so start out. How did you get into pricing? So you were an engineer. How do you get to pricing? Uh, well, it, I would say it was kind of random. Uh, so my first internship, so I, I was still in during my bachelor degree studies, and I was doing an internship at Parker Hennepin. Uh, I think you might know this company. So it's really well known for pricing strategies with uh, Dick Brown. He's very, really famous in, in, in the field. And uh, well, I was back in Brazil still, uh, and I started as an internship together with my bachelor. So it was focused in the planning and production. So I was in this department. And uh, yeah, I don't know, after a few months uh, in the internship, they called me in the room. There was the, the, uh, the manager of pricing uh, for the Latin America, my boss and uh, someone from HR. And they said, yeah, we have this uh, junior analyst position. And I said, cool, which department? And they, they told me pricing. And I said, okay, what the hell is this, Fred? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I didn't ever uh, hear about that in the company before. And then they started to explain me and they said, yeah, it would be really nice to have someone with your profile uh, working with us here uh, in our branch. And then, yeah, I joined the pricing team at Parker Hennepin, uh, I think it was 2013, and I stayed there for six and a half years. Then I went to Heineken, uh, Flixbus here in Munich, and now it's sixth. So, yeah, I would say initially it was a bit of a, a random uh, choice, or they offered me and I wanted to, to have this uh, challenge and try it. But then, of course, afterwards, it was a kind of a, a love relationship, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, so what do you love about pricing? Why do you stay in it? Well, I really like to see uh, the impact that you can uh, make in the uh, customer decision making and how you can all, at the same time uh, do a lot of uh, great stuff for the business and improve the company and not only profitability, uh, but also uh, when you have, let's say, overcapacity, you can also play with that and decrease prices, increase demand or the other way around. So during uh, complex situations, for example, during COVID, I mean, I think for most companies, at least uh, when I was working at Flixbus or at Sixth, uh, pricing department was the most important one. How do you deal with this uh, very low demand or very low unexpected demand when you don't have time to plan your capacity properly, right? It's something that was uh, unforeseen. And uh, yeah, I think pricing plays a huge role on that. And it's really nice to see this kind of uh, impact that you can generate. Yeah, and I think the problem uh, is equally important now since everybody seems to have supply constraints and we can't get enough product and, and inflation's taken off. Uh, so how do we handle that in a pricing company? Yeah, I think this was something we already saw last summer, uh, thinking about the, the travel industry or the transportation industry, that uh, yeah, demand was already picking up last summer. So there was a really, um, a really low cases in terms of Corona in Europe. I think the US was... Uh, similar and then yeah demand was picking up again but still companies were not prepared to to fulfill uh, all of this and also if you think about uh, the car industry you also have some uh, microchip prices playing a role there so pricing is really like the, on the core of how the company will uh, 
performed during these periods, right? So I think this uh, analysis that we are always doing, checking the demand on a regular basis or uh, forecast that we use to try to predict how the demand will change. And then of course, uh, when doing price changes, uh, what do we want to achieve with that, right? So we want to promote our most premium products. Do we want to retain our old customers? Uh, do we want to get the, the, the demand for short-term or for long-term uh, users and this kind of thing? So I think that's a lot of opportunities that you can play around only with pricing, which might seem a little bit simple, right? But if you look at in, in the background, in the companies, how it works, it's crazy. I mean, uh, there's huge departments of uh, pricing, depending, of course, on the type of com company. So if you go to airline uh, industry, it's crazy how many uh, pricing managers, yield managers these companies have, right? So it's a, it's a big deal in the end. Yeah, so one of the things that I heard you say just now, which I dearly loved, and, and, and dig a, li a little bit deeper on this, and you said the words, um, we need to know why we're doing a price change, why we're doing pricing. And it feels to me like most companies don't really know the answer to that question. They just want to do a price increase. Um, talk about how you learned that or, uh, or why you think that's so important. Yeah, so I think that in most cases, as you said, I mean, companies that maybe smaller ones or that they don't have like a structured price department, uh, they might do this kind of things or maybe just uh, if you have a cost increase, you just pass this cost uh, to your customers and this is like your well, yeah your way of pricing, let's say, or you just follow competition. Uh, and this is when you kind of um, lose the sense of why you are doing the price change, right? Is this something that the market uh, really expects? Uh, is this something that my competition uh, doing to, to undercut me? Should I just go down with them or not? So this is also one of the cases I think we were briefly discussing before uh, that can generate price wars, right? So if you just follow your competition, so if you don't, if you don't know the reason why you're changing the prices, uh, you can initiate a, a fight that, that in the end has no uh, uh, background or no reason to be happening, right? Uh, and, and that's also the case, for example, uh, thinking about price wars or price changes, that if you're just following the competition, you are assuming that everything that they are doing is right and that they know why they are changing prices. It might be the case, but it might be the case that they are also doing something wrong and you are just following them. So you need to understand your customers, right? And what price changes will affect them. So if I increase prices, uh, will this affect my demand? If not, uh, how much can I increase or for which type of products do I have this uh, elasticity where I can play around? on both ways, right? So this is not only for price increases. You can also decrease prices. Makes sense in a lot of times to find the products where you are charging too much and you are you have a hidden demand that you can gain if you decrease prices. And then you have a reasoning to change prices, right? Yep. So yeah. whenever Absolutely. you enter into discussions, you need to have a reasoning of why you are changing the price. Yeah. L let me address something that you just said, which I find fascinating. And maybe we slightly disagree, but I have a feeling we don't. <laughs> uh, you, you said when our competitors lower their price and we just randomly or just follow them, uh, we could be starting a price war and maybe they're making a bad decision, right? Maybe they're making the wrong decision. And so we shouldn't do that. But one of the things I often think about is if my customers are deciding between my product and my competitor's product, it doesn't matter if my competitor was stupid when they lowered their price, they lowered their price. Mm -hmm. And so if I want those customers to still choose me, I have to be somehow relative, hopefully a little bit higher priced and selling more value, but I still have to be relative to them, even if they made a stupid decision. Yeah, of course. I mean, I totally agree. And I don't think we should, like, say, ignore our competition completely, right? That's uh, definitely not, not what I'm saying. And it really depends on the market that you are, right? So if you're thinking about the beer industry, where you just go uh, to the supermarket in the shelf and you have all the products right there to you with their prices. So these are usually some customers that are really price sensitive. So if your competitor made a mistake and decreased the prices, it's very likely that he will get the demand, right? But yeah. two things. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'd say two things that play a role is that uh, for how long will they stick with this mistake or until they find out that this was a mistake? So if it takes too long, maybe you'll also need to react, right? Uh, and in the end, if also if your customers will change or not. So you also need to know if your uh, customers, they are really, let's say, loyal to your brand. It really depends on the case. If we think, uh, giving the example of where I worked uh, with Heineken, in some markets, there are really a lot of loyal customers. 
uh, that are loyal to the brand. And at the same time, there is this brand differentiation. So it's supposed to be a, a premium product. Uh, Heineken sponsors uh, uh, Formula One, uh, sponsors the Champions League. So you also have this differentiation or this creation of value, as you can also call it, right? Yeah. And so just to make sure all the listeners are thinking through this with us, let's pretend for a second that Heineken, because of the brand name or the loyalty, they, uh, their customers would pay 20 cents more than the competitor. And so ideally we want to price it 20 cents higher than our competitors or 19 cents or somewhere in that ballpark. If my competitor lowers their price by 10 cents, now I've got a 30 cent price premium, even though I still have that premium, I, I may lose a lot of business because customers only were willing to pay 20 cents more. Uh, so I'm completely with you. And by the way, I'm super jealous that you got to work in the beer industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's definitely a, a nice job. Yeah. yeah. Hey, let's talk about the behavioral economics. You're going to be speaking to PPS coming up as, as am I, and uh, your topic is going to be behavioral economics. And exactly. I just love, I love thinking about and talking about behavioral economics. Uh, but before we jump in, let me tell you what I don't like about behavioral economics. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah sure. <clears throat> so I think we split, I personally, in my mind, split the world of pricing up into two sides. And so for the sake of argument, I'm going to call them rational and irrational. Another way to think of that is value and behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And I spend most of my time and energy thinking about the value side. How do I get the value messages across? How do I get people to sell value and create value? Uh, but that's not to say that I don't like the behavioral economics side because I think it's a lot of fun and really mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, so first off, do you disagree with my with my thought? No, I think I would say that it's a combination. It will always be a combination of both, right? So there's one. Uh, let's say I would say that the the core part of it should probably be uh, value. Right, but you also have some some uh, tweaks that you can make with behavioral economics. Yep. Okay, so I didn't so, actually yeah. I didn't actually say what I don't like about behavioral economics. So here it comes. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Behavioral economics is more fun and it gets more attention than the value side of pricing. That's what I don't like about it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you. I understand your point, uh, and I mean, I just got into this field of behavioral economics more recently, so I. Just as you mentioned, I have much more experience with pricing, value-based pricing, how yeah, can we use so that better pricing strategies to, to make more profits. But I think that I totally agree that uh, behavior economics cannot generate as much value as uh, pricing departments can generate, right? Uh, and is, on the other hand, a much nicer topic to talk about or to show results. You can, you can definitely uh, play around and create experiments and you can uh, very easily show the results of it, right? And it's something that uh, calls people attention because it's actually behavior and that's something that they do as well, right? So everybody wants to, to, to listen and to hear about the heuristics or the mistakes, the biases that they take when they're making decisions. And that's why I think it's a topic that call, calls more the attention than uh, pricing, let's say. Yeah, so, so let's talk about some of the, the aspects or some of the behavioral economics. Uh, let's call them um, tactics, not tricks. How's that? We'll call them tactics. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things that I always find is I sometimes find myself getting caught into these some of these tactics. And it's just like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> step back. Don't do yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, so what do you think is your favorite behavioral economics tactic? Or, or let's say the most powerful. Well, it, it's complicated to say what is the most powerful. I think that there are a lot of things that you can play together, right? I mean, I will tell you the one I don't like maybe first, <laughs> but I think that, for example, uh, the price endings is something that is, uh, it became something really popular and everybody does it. And for me, in the end, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I just, so if you go to a supermarket, everything will end with nine cents. And I mean, if you think a bit in the end, it's, it's senseless, right? Pedro, I have to tell you, my doctoral dissertation was on price endings. Oh, okay, cool. But, I mean, that's what I mean. It's a nice topic, but everybody's doing it. I don't know. Maybe I don't know when you did your uh, your PhD, maybe a while ago, right? Long time ago. Well, yeah, exactly. So, so the truth is, first off, let me tell you why it works, if that's okay, and then uh, and then it makes all the sense in the world that everybody should be using nines as their price endings. Um, almost everybody. There's some exceptions. The reason it works is because we are lazy subtractors. And so if we're trying to compare two prices, we usually subtract the prices 
And if it's easy to subtract the prices, then we do exactly that. But if it's hard, so if I ask you to, to subtract 72 from 57, you're like, yeah, that's like 20 cents. Okay, got it. And, and you wouldn't be very far off if you made that estimate. But if, if everyone's gonna look at my price as 52, then why wouldn't I just make it 59 and get the extra seven cents? No, no, I totally agree. And I know it works. It's not the point, but I think it's like the, the silly one that people uh, fell in this trap, let's say, or in this tactic, right? It, uh, yeah, it is but, nowhere, nowhere near as powerful as many of the other behavioral economics tactics. Yeah, exactly. something I really like, it's related to mental accounting, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a business that you can sell different products, uh, yeah, over different point touch points with the customer, it also changes a lot. So if you're thinking about a um, air flight industry, so if you're selling the seat and then another touch point with the user, you offer them an upgrade. Uh, it might be the case that they are more willing to spend because they already paid their ticket on their mental accounting. So this phase was done. Now it's maybe another uh, a month already. And then they are more willing to, to pay for this upgrade or to do a, yeah book a seat or extra luggage and so on, right? So these different touch points uh, and how mental accounting works, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, so on the first purchase, they're thinking, I have to buy a ticket, right? So what's the price? And I, and I may not want to pay the full price of a first class ticket or something like that. But after I bought the ticket, someone sends me a note that says, hey, wouldn't you like to fly in comfort for this much more? It's a very different thought process. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, in the end, it's the same thing. You will pay the same value, maybe even more if you're uh, buying this upgrade afterwards, right? Uh, but the way that we people in you usually count the money or how they spend the money, it's a, a bit uh, different, right? Uh, there's also one effect uh, on how we spend money uh, over the course of the month that people tend to spend more in the beginning just because you have more money in your account, even even though you're going to survive the whole month with the same amount of money, when you receive your paycheck, okay, let's go out for dinner. And then in the end of the month, I don't know, you're eating sandwiches at home, you know? Yeah. It's also something that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's behavioral, but that's how people uh, do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, um, and so one of the things I find fascinating is the behavioral economics researchers come up with a lot of these effects, right? So the, the mental accounting effect or the endowment effect. And, mm -hmm. and what, I, what I don't think we do a good enough job as is pricing people or economics people are listing all of the uses of that, right? Where are the places we can do that? Uh, I thought you came up with two really good examples for mental accounting, um, but, but I think we ought to yeah. think through more yeah. of those. I mean, I think I saw once one example, I don't remember which industry was, food industry or yeah, something from retailers. Uh, and that they would use this uh, different types of discounts uh, across the course of the month, right? Uh, just with this example that I gave that people tend to spend more. So in the beginning of the month, I think it was something maybe uh, Burger King, I don't remember, but that they would give some sort of a um, volume discount in the beginning. So I don't know, you buy two, you get one uh, extra for free because you have more money and they want to get a larger share of this uh, revenue that you have. Uh, and then in the end of the month, they would work with uh, percentage discounts. So you have less money in your pocket, you're less willing to spend and then 10% discount if you buy one or half a burger, it's already fine. Uh, yeah. Right. So it's also one way of playing with this behavior of spending more uh, money in the beginning of the month and uh, less in the end of the month. So probably there's also some different seasonalities that I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly the case, but it was something like this. I think it's also a uh, good application of it. Yeah. So what do you think of the uh, ads when, when someone's trying to sell you something and they say uh, it's less than a cup of coffee a day? Exactly. This is also something like, uh, yeah, it's kind of a behavior economics thing, right? So that you have always like the lower price you can offer or that you can display. And then in my mental accounting, it's like, yeah, $1 per day, it's fine. But if I had to pay 30 uh, per month, it would be maybe too much to spend once, right? So this is also something uh, really interesting. So uh, and people uh, buy it, right? They think it's a good deal, even though it's the same thing or even worse than it was before i don't know maybe before creating this policy it was 15 dollars, and now they say okay let's just charge one per day or communicate it as one per day and people will uh, will think it's better yep absolutely 
Um, so describe for our, for the listeners, what is loss aversion? Well, this is uh, how we feel about losses and that we tend to, to feel them more, right? Uh, so it, it's also related uh, to, to the behavior of how we, we feel. For example, if I ask you, what would you prefer, like uh, to get uh, 1, 900 euros for sure or 1,000, uh, sorry, 900 euros for sure, or 1,000 uh, with 90% of chance and 10% of not getting anything. So this is uh, the, the expected value is the same, right? But in this case, you are gaining the money, you will probably go for the uh, certainty and take the 900 for sure. But if you go the other way around and ask you if you want to lose 900 or get uh, 1,000 uh, with 90%, you would prefer the risky option because you don't want to lose. You want to have this uh, tiny possibility of not losing anything because it's better. So you prefer to maybe lose 1,000, but have this small chance of not losing anything because we don't like to lose, right? We want to, to keep what we have. And I think loss aversion might be also a bit related to the endowment effect that you mentioned. So we tend to value more the things that we have. And uh, if we want to sell something that is already ours, we will always value more than, than the market and or the, the other buyer. So I think it's a bit in this relation, right? Yeah, and so Kahneman and Tversky always use the words losses loom larger than gains. Exactly. And, uh, and in my mind, I can't not say those words. So I just had to say them. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. And I think this, uh, yeah, it's a great skill of study. I really like to, to go in through these uh, topics, not only uh, from, um, from Kahneman and Tversky, but there's also uh, Dan Arley. I think he's uh, one really nice guy. I mean, he has some really nice experiments to, to check. And also Richard Taylor, I mean, yeah, he's like the Pope of the area, maybe. Yeah, a lot, a lot of them are pretty fascinating. So, um, first off, let's use a couple. Let's t toss out a couple examples of uh, loss aversion and why that's so important. Uh, do you have one? Or do you want me to throw one out first? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned, for example, this with uh, with the, the money. If, what would you prefer, like to to lose or right? Oh but, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, but I meant in business, right? Something that we could do or oh, use. Okay. Or, <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is a bit tough. I mean, I don't think I ever thought about any usage of loss aversion. So, so uh, let me let me give you business. some, and you can you can cl chime in here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so one that I love, this is just fabulous, is uh, if you have two products, one's expensive and one's less expensive, which one do you present first? And here's what happens: is if you present the less expensive one first, you describe all the features, you say the price. Someone's put that in their mind now. And then you say, but you can get these additional features for this additional price. So the additional features looks like a gain. The additional price looks like a loss. Losses loom larger than gains. So it's harder to get people to buy that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you present the more expensive one first, and then you say, but you can get this other one if we take away these few features at this lower price. Now the price is a gain, the features are a loss, losses loom larger than gains so therefore people are more likely to buy the more expensive one i just i think that's a fascinating example yeah, yeah exactly and and this is uh, i mean uh, people or we we have a uh, really uh, good imaginations right so when we are already checking the products we are already considering how we would feel with these products and how would we feel if we had these products right or uh, no matter what we are buying and if we start to, let's say removing features or removing benefits of this product we'll already feel it as a loss i think there's one also really good example which is related to uh, let's say you have a product and you have um, yeah, it's also related to the features or adding new features that you can check okay i also want this i want this extra and this other extra so let's uh, i think the example i read was uh, related to pizzas so that you have like the uh, the dough and then you can click and add all the the ingredients or the extras you want, right? And if you pre-select everything when you show to your customers, they need to remove what they don't want, and they will usually keep more uh, extras or more toppings than the ones that need to select exactly what they want. And that's because once you have already selected, you believe, okay, this is already that I everything I have. Okay, what do I really don't want? Otherwise, I will keep it, right? I don't want to lose any of these uh, features or these uh, toppings that I already have. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous example. Right? I love that one. Um, and you can yeah. apply this really simple right, business. The, the, um, the one piece of behavioral economics that I teach a lot of, I, I mean, it's the one 
one technique that I think is very, very useful. And that is when we build good, better, best product lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there's no real good reason for that other than behavioral economics. I'm, I'm sorry. It simplifies decision-making so people don't have to know everything about everything. But, uh, but the real issue is people buy the one in the middle because they're afraid of making a mistake. Right. Yeah, so they yeah, don't exactly. want to buy they don't want to buy the cheap one because it might not be good enough. They don't want to buy the expensive one because they might be wasting money. So they buy the one in the middle. And, uh, and I just find that fascinating. Yeah, exactly. There's also uh, the term of adding one uh, ugly brother. It's also similar. So you just create one product, uh, which is a worse version or a more expensive version compared to the one you actually want to sell. And then you just make the comparison easier, right? So that people can just see the two options and say, okay, this is definitely worse than this one. So this is what I want to take. And uh, with the extremes, it's kind of the same thing. You just want to avoid these mistakes or you want to avoid the extremes as uh, they call it, right? So you just go for the middle, uh, it's probably the best option. And this is something, there are several studies like proving how effective this is, right? So how people actually change their behavior when you have like, uh, yeah, that's a good, better, great. And also uh, this ugly brother version of your product. So this yes. is really interesting. Yeah. So I've not heard it called the ugly brother. I understand what you're saying. And uh, okay. usually we call it the decoy effect. Um, I've seen it yeah. called that. Um, and so if you guys are listening, you want to look up the, I think it's the economist example that Dan Ariely writes about as the best yeah, example. Exactly. Of that. Yeah, exactly. But I think, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I saw it from Dan Ariely also with uh, the economist. Uh, and I think he mentioned one other experiment that he did with uh, a picture of students uh, from the university that they needed to choose uh, uh, who would they like to date. And then he would have two uh, pictures from different stu uh, students. And in the middle, he would create one ugly version of one of them. And then you just make like the comparison easy. So you just, we will just compare the two that are the same. So the ugly one and the, let's say the normal one, and then you go for the normal one because yeah, but you just make the comparison easier. When you have two different people, we have so many different characteristics that it's harder to compare. And if you have just two similar options, uh, one which is clearly worse than the other, you, you make the choice easier. That is pretty fascinating. Pedro, this has just been a, a ton of fun so far, but we are running out of time. Let okay. me ask you our final question. Uh, what's one piece of pricing advice you'd give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Well, okay. So, I, I mean, as a, we are just talking about behavior economics, I think that this is one really uh, nice topic to be explored. So if you never heard about behavior economics inside your company or in your market, you can definitely start searching of it and thinking about these uh, topics we discussed it and how to adapt them to, to your market, right? So we mentioned several different uh, uh, effects of uh, behavior economics uh, and several different examples of how they can be applied on real business. And I mean, if you think about it, it's, they were quite simple, right? It's really easy to test this kind of things and uh, they can generate some really nice benefits to your company for sure. Yeah, I think that, I think we should all be thinking about things like behavioral economics. And, and by the way, this is no different than thinking about what kind of marketing message are you gonna deliver, right? You, so want to deli you want to deliver the message that puts your product in the best light and people think good things about it. And, and we can do the exact same thing with pricing and packaging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's really related to communication, communication of value and communication of different price strategies, yes. Yes, yeah, so Pedro, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Yeah, they can contact me directly via my LinkedIn. Uh, it's Pedro Picoli Suarez, uh, but you can also share the uh, URL and totally fine. Yep, we'll have the link in the show notes. Perfect. Episode 166 is all done. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.